Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the sinking of the Musashi, sister ship of the Yamato, which sank in 1944. Before we dive in, I must inform you, this story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, Nazism, imperialism, suicide, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Your discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. In today's episode, there will be some terms in the Japanese language in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. I have heard the desire for more World War II battleships, and I am ready to answer the call. Originally, I'd planned to cover SS Emo. However, we have all year to cover her. I figured Yamato's story was so interesting, I wanted to cover her sister ship as well. Sit back and enjoy, dear listeners. This one is going to be a good one. Since we already covered Yamato, we have been acquainted with Musashi. Just like we said in last week's episode, Yamato and her sister Musashi came about because the Japanese didn't believe they could keep up with the United States and their ability to produce warships in such vast quantities. So they decided to make ships that were enormous and powerful instead, trumping the armaments seen on American vessels. The two sisters would be the largest, heaviest battleships ever constructed and the largest of World War II. Musashi was ordered in June of 1937, being laid down in the Mitsubishi shipyard in Nagasaki on March 29, 1938, roughly half a year after her older sister Yamato. Musashi displaced 63,000 long tons unladen and about 71,000 tons fully loaded. The vessel was 862 feet and 10 inches long, had a beam of 121 feet and 1 inch wide, and a draft of 35 feet and 8 inches tall when she was fully loaded. This made her the same length as Yamato, but a few feet skinnier, and her draft was about a half a foot shorter. As for her complement, the crew consisted of 2,500 officers and ratings initially, though after repairs, this was upped to 2,800 in 1944. For propulsion, she was equipped with four sets of three Campon water tube boilers capable of producing 150,000 horsepower, which powered four steam turbines, and she had four propellers. She had a stowage capacity of 6,300 long tons of fuel oil, which gave her a range of 7,200 nautical miles when traveling at 16 knots, though the ship was capable of reaching speeds of up to 27.5 knots. She was also fitted with two catapults on her quarter deck to launch aircraft, and she could carry up to seven float planes in the hangar below the decks. She operated Mitsubishi F-1M biplanes and Aichi E-13A-1 monoplanes. To recover the planes, she used a stern-mounted crane that was 5.9 long tons. She was nearly identical to Yamato, and their capabilities were incredibly similar. She was pretty technologically advanced, just like Yamato, being equipped with four rangefinders capable of viewing up to 49 feet and 3 inches ahead, with one being positioned atop her forward superstructure as well as a rear superstructure and one in each of the main gun turrets. Low angle fire was regulated by two Type 98 fire control directors mounted above the two rangefinders on the superstructure, and Type 94 high angle directors regulated her 5 inch guns. Type 95 short range directors controlled her 1 inch guns. We'll get into her armament in a couple minutes, but Musashi was fitted with even more interesting technology that was state of the art for her time. One of these things was a Type 0 hydrophone system in the bow, though it was only usable when the ship was stationary or traveling at slower speeds. As a reminder for anyone who is unaware, a hydrophone is a microphone specifically designed to be used underwater and pick up underwater sounds, with most being based on a piezoelectric transducer that generates an electric potential when subjected to pressure changes, such as sound waves. Later in September of 1942, she'd be equipped with a Type 21 air surge radar that was installed on the roof of the 49-foot rangefinder in the forward superstructure. In July of 1943, two Type 22 surface search radars would be installed on the forward superstructure. During the repairs in April of 1944, the Type 21 radar was replaced by the newer version, and a Type 13 early warning radar was installed as well, which detects long-range targets as early as possible. Next, we'll cover what kind of guns Musashi was packing. Now, we're getting into her armament and armor. Please keep in mind that I am no expert when it comes to munitions or military technology, and that I'm merely relaying what information I could find. 
For her main battery, Musashi had nine 45 caliber 18.1 inch Type 94 guns mounted in three triple turrets, similar to Yamato, and these ran from the bow to the stern. The guns were capable of firing 1.5 to 2 rounds a minute. As for the secondary battery, there were 12 60 caliber 6.1 inch third year type guns mounted in four triple turrets, with one in the bow, one in the stern, and two amidships, one to port and one to starboard. These were taken from the Mogami-class cruisers when they were rearmed with 7.9-inch guns. To protect from enemy aircraft, Musashi was armed with 12 40 caliber 5-inch Type 89 dual-purpose guns assembled in six twin turrets, with three on each side lining the superstructure. She also carried 36 1-inch Type 96 light anti-aircraft guns in 12 triple gun mounts, which were all on the superstructure. As if this wasn't overkill enough, she also had two twin mounts for the license-built 0.52-inch Type 93 anti-aircraft machine guns, and there was one on each side of the bridge. When she was being repaired in April of 1944, as we mentioned earlier, the two 6.1-inch wing turrets were taken out, and in their place were six triple one-inch gun mounts, three on each side. There was a total of 16 triple one-inch mounts and 25 single mounts added at this time as well for a grand total of 115 light anti-aircraft guns. To say she was armed to the teeth would be an understatement. As for her armor, she had the same waterline armor belt to Yamato's at 16.1 inches thick, angling outward 20 degrees at the top. Below that was a strake, or longitudinal course of planking or plating, which runs from the stem post to the stern post or transom, of armor that ranged from 7.9 inches to 10.6 inches thick over the machinery spaces and magazines. At its bottom edge, it tapered down to a thickness of 3 inches. As for deck armor, which helps against attacks from the air, it ranged in thickness of 7.9 inches to 9.1 inches thick. Turrets were protected with three main armor plates, one on the roof that was 10.6 inches thick, one on the face that was 25.6 inches thick, and one on the sides, which was 9.8 inches thick. The barbettes of the turrets had armor as well, ranging from 11 to 22 inches thick. The turrets of the 6.1 inch guns had 2 inch thick armor plates. The sides of the conning tower, which is a raised platform on a ship or submarine where an officer in charge can take the con or take charge of the vessel, had armor that was 19.7 inches thick and the roof's armor was 7.9 inches thick. Underneath the magazine were armor plates ranging from 2 to 3.1 inches thick in order to protect the ship from damage from sea mines. Musashi had 1,147 watertight compartments, 1,065 of which were underneath the armor deck and 82 were above. There were m this many of them in order to preserve buoyancy in the event of taking battle damage. So, as we can tell, she was readily equipped for battle. To cope with the building of this massive vessel, her slipway was reinforced, two floating cranes were built, and nearby workshops were expanded. When her keel was laid, she was designated battleship number two until she'd be named. While she was being built, she too was covered with a giant tarp or curtain weighing 450 short tons to keep outsiders from leering at the top secret vessel. The launching of Musashi was yet another challenge for her builders. It took two years to assemble her 13 foot 1 inch thick launching platform, made entirely out of 17 inch Douglas fir planks that were bolted together because it's incredibly difficult to drill perfectly straight bolt holes through 13 feet of fresh lumber. There was also the problem in needing to slow and stop the massive hole once she was inside the narrow Nagasaki Harbor, and this challenge was solved by attaching 560 long tons of heavy-duty chain to both sides of the hull, which created drag resistance in the water to slow the ship. Once again, like we covered in the last episode, this is all based upon Newton's first law of motion. It states that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, and in this case, that outside force would be the drag created by the chains. They wanted to launch the ship in total secrecy, and they went to great lengths to ensure this happened. The Japanese government even organized an air raid drill on the same day of the launching to ensure most of the citizens in Nagasaki would be in their homes that day instead of anywhere near the harbor. She was launched on November 1st, 1940, coming to a stop merely three feet further than she was expected, which was 720 feet across the harbor. Because of how heavy the ship was, there was a 3 foot 11 inch wave resulting from the launching that swept across the harbor and local rivers, flooding some homes and causing small fishing boats nearby to capsize. Musashi would be fitted out, which is a process in shipbuilding that follows the launching and precedes sea trials that completes construction of the ship at nearby Sasebo, and her first captain would be assigned, Captain Korumu Arima. 
Near the end of outfitting, the ship's flagship facilities, which included those in the admiral's cabins and those on the bridge, would be modified to be in line with the combined fleet's desire to have the ship be fully equipped as the flagship of the commander-in-chief, since her older sister Yamato was pretty much completed and these important changes couldn't be made. The alterations were made along with improvements in her secondary battery armor, and this pushed back her completion and pre-handover testing by two months to August of 1942. Finally, Musashi was commissioned on August 5, 1942 at Nagasaki, and there she'd be assigned to the 1st Battleship Division, along with Mutsu, Nagato, and her sister ship Yamato. Five days later, she conducted aircraft handling and machinery trials near Hashirajima, with her armament being fitted between September 3rd and 28th of 1942 at Kure, as well as her Type 21 radar. She was working for the rest of the year, with Arima being promoted to Rear Admiral on November 1st. She'd be assigned to the combined fleet commanded by Admiral Isoroko Yamamoto on January 15, 1943, a little over a year and one month after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Three days later, she'd set off for truck, arriving safely on January 22 of that year. On February 11, she would replace her sister ship Yamato as the fleet's new flagship. Yamamoto left Musashi and flew to Rabaul, New Britain on April 3rd, 1943 to direct Operation I Go personally. Operation I Go was an aerial counteroffensive launched by the Imperial Japanese forces against the Allies during the Solomon Islands and New Guinea campaigns in the Pacific Theater of World War II, taking place from April 1st through the 16th of 1943. Unfortunately for Admiral Yamamoto, his orders would be intercepted by MAGIC, which was an Allied cryptanalysis project during World War II. American Lockheed P-38 Lightning fighters shot down his transport aircraft, and they killed Yamamoto in Operation Vengeance while he was on his way from New Britain to Balalay, Bougainville Island. He was cremated, and on April 23rd, his remains were flown to truck and placed in his cabin on board Musashi to be transported home to Japan. In response to American attacks on Atu Island on May 17th, Musashi, two heavy cruisers, nine destroyers, and the carrier Hiyo sortied to the northern Pacific. If you missed last episode, sortieing is coming out from a defensive position to make an attack. No contact was made with the Americans, and so the fleet of ships continued onward to Kure on May 23rd, where Yamamoto's ashes were taken in preparation for a formal state funeral, which is a public funeral ceremony held to honor people of national significance. After this, Musashi's task force was broadly reinforced to counterattack the Americans off Atu, but the island was captured before the force could stop it. On June 9th, Arima was relieved of his command of Musashi and replaced by Captain Keizo Kuruma. On June 24th, the ship was being overhauled at Yokosuka Naval Arsenal when the vessel was visited by Emperor Hirohito and high-ranking naval officers. This was an incredibly important highlight for Musashi's career, and it means the ship was one of the prides of her nation. From July 1st to the 8th of 1943, Musashi was fitted with a pair of Type 22 radars at Kure, and later on July 30th, she sailed for truck, arriving six days later. There, she assumed her position as fleet flagship for Admiral Mianichi Koga. In response to suspicions of planned American raids on Wake Island, Musashi led a large fleet in mid-October to intercept the Americans, but they failed to make contact. The fleet of three carriers, 11 cruisers, six battleships, and Musashi returned to truck on October 26th. For the remainder of 1943, Musashi would remain in port in Truck Lagoon. Komura was promoted to Rear Admiral as of November 1st, 1943, and so he'd be transferred to the 3rd Fleet on December 7th, acting as the Chief of Staff. And so in his stead, Captain Bunji Asakura mastered Musashi. Musashi finally left Truck Lagoon for Yokosuka on February 10th, 1944, and she again left on February 24th for Palau. With her, she carried one Imperial Japanese Army Battalion and one Special Naval Landing Forces Battalion, along with all of their equipment. Mother Nature, as we know, shows no mercy, and so after losing much of her deck cargo in a typhoon, she finally arrived at Palau safely on February 29, 1944. Musashi would remain in Palau for the next month, departing on March 29 in the dark to avoid an air raid that the Japanese were anticipating. However, she did not escape unscathed. On her way out, she ran into the submarine USS Tunney, which fired six torpedoes. Of these six torpedoes, five missed, and one blew a hole near the bow that was 19 feet in diameter. Immediately, more than 3,000 tons of water flooded into the ship, and seven crewmen were killed instantly, with another 11 being wounded. The ship received temporary repairs later that night, sailing for Curé Naval Arsenal and arriving there on April 3rd. 
she'd be docked and repaired between April 10th and 22nd of 1944, and this is also when she'd receive some much-needed improvements. Her anti-aircraft armament would be substantially increased after the removal of the 6.1-inch beam-mounted triple turrets, with her secondary battery finally comprising of 131-inch guns, 4 half-inch machine guns, 6 6.1-inch guns, and 24 5-inch guns. Not only were her guns upgraded, but she also received depth charge rails on her fantail and new radars, which were still primitive when compared to their American counterparts. When she undocked on April 22, 1944, she was armed and ready to roll. Asakura was promoted to Rear Admiral in May of 1944, with Musashi departing Kure for Okinawa later on May 10, and then off to Atawi Tawi on May 12. Along with sister ship Yamato, she'd be assigned to the first mobile fleet under the command of Vice Admiral Jisabura Ozawa. And on June 10th, the sisters and their fleet departed for Bachan under the command of another Vice Admiral, Matome Ugaki. They were preparing for Operation Khan, which was a planned counterattack against the Americans' invasion of Biak. On June 12th, Ugaki caught word of the Americans attacking Saipan, and thus his forces would be diverted to the Mariana Islands instead. On June 16th, the fleet rendezvoused with Ozawa's main force, and yet again the sisters would be reassigned, this time to Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita's second fleet, which you might remember from Yamato's story. The sisters from here on out will have stories that line up pretty closely. The sisters participated in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, and Musashi was not provoked or damaged during this fight. As we know from the previous episode, Japan suffered a massive loss at the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which is also nicknamed the, quote, Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, and so the second fleet retreated to Japan. On July 8th, Yamato and Musashi embarked 3,522 men and equipment of the Army's 106th Infantry Regiment of the 49th Infantry Division between the two ships, and they sailed for Linga Island, arriving on July 16th and 17th of 1944. They remained there for the next three months. We've arrived at the Battle of Late Gulf, this time from the perspective of Musashi. Her new captain, Toshihira Inogushi, relieved Asakura to take command of Musashi on August 12, 1944, and he'd be promoted to Rear Admiral on October 15. Three days after, on October 18, 1944, Musashi sailed for Brunei Bay, Borneo Island, to join the main Japanese fleet. They're preparing for Operation Show Go, which was yet another planned counterattack against the Americans, this time against those that were landing at late. According to the plan, Ozawa's carrier forces were going to lure the American carrier fleets north of late so that Kirita's 1st Division Force, also known as the Center Force, Force A, or First Striking Force, could safely enter late Gulf to attack the Americans landing on the beach. Musashi, Yamato, and the rest of Force A left Brunei for the Philippines on October 22, 1944. On October 23rd, the heavy cruiser Maya was targeted by the submarine USS Dace, being torpedoed and sunk near Palawan. A fellow destroyer, Akishima, rescued 769 survivors from the disaster and these men were transferred to Musashi later that day. The following day, on October 24, 1944, Musashi was sailing through the Sibuyan Sea with the rest of Force A, and Kurita's fleet was sighted by reconnaissance aircraft launched from USS Intrepid. It took just a little over two hours for Musashi to be attacked by eight Curtis 2B-2C Helldiver dive bombers launched from USS Intrepid at 10.27 a.m. One 500-pound bomb did strike the roof of turret number one, but it failed to penetrate the armor. Two minutes later, at 10.29 a.m., Musashi was hit again, this time by a torpedo from a Grumman TBF Avenger, also from USS Intrepid, and this torpedo hit her amidships on the starboard side. Instantly, there was a 5.5-degree list to starboard after 3,000 tons of water flooded into the vessel. However, because of counter-flooding compartments on the port side, the list would be reduced to 1 degree. For anyone who missed last week's episode, counter-flooding is the practice of flooding compartments in a ship to counterbalance listing and loss of trim resulting especially from already flooded compartments. During this attack, Musashi managed to shoot down two Grumman TBF Avengers. An hour and a half later, eight more Hell Divers launched from USS Intrepid attacked Musashi once more. One bomb hit the upper deck, but failed to detonate, with the second hitting the port side of the deck, penetrating two decks before it exploded, just above one of the engine rooms. From this explosion, fragments and shrapnel broke open a steam pipe in the engine room, forcing the crew to abandon it, as well as crew in an adjacent engine room having to abandon their station. Due to all of this commotion, power was entirely lost to the port inboard propeller shaft, and the ship's speed was reduced to 22 knots. 
During this attack, anti-aircraft gunners aboard Musashi shot down two Helldivers. Three minutes after this attack, nine Avengers attacked from both the port and starboard sides of the ship, successfully landing three torpedo hits on the port side of the ship. One hit just next to turret number one. The second flooded a hydraulic machinery room and forced the main turrets to switch over to auxiliary hydraulic pumps, and the third and final torpedo flooded yet another engine room. There was more counter-flooding performed to reduce the list to one degree to port, but all of this flooding had a negative effect in and of itself. The forward freeboard was reduced by six feet, and there was a misfire during this attack. Musashi fired Sonshi Kadan anti-aircraft shells from her main armament, and one of these shells exploded in the middle of turret number one, possibly due to a bomb fragment in the barrel, and this destroyed the turret's elevating machinery. At 1.31 p.m., 29 aircraft from USS Essex and USS Lexington managed to attack Musashi. Two Grumman F-6F Hellcat fighters strafed along the ship's deck, with Helldivers landing four more bombs near the forward turrets. Musashi was hit by four more torpedoes, three of which were forward of turret number one, and this caused massive flooding, with the ship's one-degree list now shifting to the starboard side. She'd taken on so much water that her bow was down 13 feet, which is significant, and her speed was again reduced, this time to 20 knots. Two hours after this attack, around 3.20 p.m., nine Helldivers from the carrier USS Enterprise dropped 1,000-pound armor-piercing bombs on Musashi, four of which hit. Three more torpedoes plowed into the starboard bow of Musashi, blowing it open and immensely slowing her down to 13 knots. She couldn't run from her attackers now, as she listed to 10 degrees to port. A few minutes later, at 3.25 p.m., 37 more aircraft swarmed in from the light carrier USS Cabot, the fleet carrier USS Franklin, and again from USS Intrepid, with the swarm landing 13 bombs and 11 more torpedoes on Musashi. The Musashi bit back and was able to strike down three Helldivers and three Avengers. Her speed went from 13 knots to 6 knots due to the heavy flooding, with her main steering engine being temporarily knocked out and her rudder being momentarily jammed 15 degrees to port. Counterflooding was once again employed to reduce the severe list from 10 degrees to 6 degrees to port. At this point, Musashi had withstood 17 bombs and 19 torpedoes. Kurita left Musashi behind to either sink or swim at 3.30 p.m., running into her again around 4.21 p.m. after reversing course. From what we know, she was headed north with a list of at least 10 degrees to port, with her bow down 26 feet and water splashing up onto the forecastle. The forecastle, for anyone unaware, is the upper deck of a sailing ship forward of the foremast, so essentially the very front part of the bow. Kurita ordered two destroyers and a heavy cruiser to escort her. Meanwhile, frantic efforts were being made to try to correct her list, including flooding yet another engine room and a few of her boiler rooms. They were going to beach her to save her, but unfortunately her engine stopped before they could get her there. At 7.15 p.m., she listed 12 degrees, and the crew was finally ordered to abandon Musashi. Fifteen minutes later, the crew evacuated as the list had rapidly accelerated to 30 degrees. She capsized at 7.36 p.m., sinking in 4,430 feet of water at 13 degrees 7 minutes north, 122 degrees 32 minutes east. Captain Inoguchi decided to go down with Musashi, with 1,023 following him to the bottom. Of the 2,399 people aboard, 1,376 survived, and 635 men from the Maya who had been rescued by Musashi were again rescued by Shimakaze. Half of the surviving crew from Musashi were evacuated to Japan, and the other half were shipped off to the Philippines to defend Japan's position there. There were numerous attempts by various shipwreck hunters to find Musashi for over 70 years after she foundered, but none of these succeeded. Musashi, like many Japanese warships at the time, did not have her name displayed on the hull, and so it would be damn near impossible to identify her. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen actually sponsored the eight-year search of the research team that found her, after they'd meticulously gone through numerous historical records from different countries, deployed an ROV, and used the high-tech yacht Octopus to search for Musashi. Allen announced the team's finding in March of 2015 in the Sibuyan Sea in the Philippines, roughly 3,000 feet or more beneath the waves. Originally, it was thought that Musashi went down in one piece, However, upon finding her, they discovered she'd actually exploded underwater, littering the seafloor with debris. Her bow from the first barbette forward is upright on the ocean floor, though the stern is upside down. The forward superstructure and funnel are detached from the wreckage lying on its port side. 
The team live streamed their find, and in the video, a mount for the seal of the Imperial Japanese Navy, which is a chrysanthemum made of teak rotted away after all the years, is visible in the debris. The video also displayed the colossal damage the Americans inflicted upon the ship, including warping the bow and enormous hits under the ship's main gun. There were other items found in the area of the wreck, as well as more features found inside the wreck that have led maritime experts to be 90% sure that this wreck is Musashi's. Just to be certain, they had Shigeru Nakajima, an electrical technician on Musashi, who claimed to have survived by jumping overboard, told the Associated Press that he was, quote, certain the wreckage the team found was Musashi after he saw the anchor and the Imperial seal mount. He also expressed gratitude to the team for finding the ship he'd spent so much time aboard. However, the discovery of the wreck does have some controversy about it. It raised issues in the Philippines due to the fact Roblin, which is the local government with jurisdiction over the shipwreck, site, as well as the Philippine Coast Guard and the provincial government were unaware that Allen's team had been searching in the area for Musashi, though Governor Eduardo Fermalo openly welcomed the discovery of the vessel. The Philippine Coast Guard stated that all foreign-owned vessels must have clearance from the Philippine Foreign Affairs Department, the Immigration Bureau, and the Customs Bureau before entering Philippine waters in response to the discovery of Musashi. The discovery was incredibly important to the people of Japan because of the over 1,000 sailors who remains lie with Musashi. But despite this, the National Museum of the Philippines stated that, quote, any further activity pertaining to the shipwreck would be governed by established rules and regulations. The museum pointed out that, by law in the Philippines, the wreck of Musashi is an archaeological site under Romblin's jurisdiction. Thus, the museum was, quote, giving priority to verifying the discovery, obtaining and sharing key information, facilitating the protection and preservation of the site, and formulating appropriate next steps. While I agree that these are all fair and well things to do, I do feel sympathy for any remaining family and relatives of the over 1,000 sailors who perished with Musashi, as they just want closure and to be able to bury their family members. Later, after Musashi sank, as we know, Yamato would face a similar fate and she too would sink. The two Yamato-class battleships were unique, formidable foes in their era, but this was not enough to save them from the depths of the Pacific Ocean. Regardless of the feelings toward Imperial Japan and their actions in World War II, rest in peace to the sailors who perished. They were men with friends and families and were following their orders. War is ugly, and it always will be. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us, and don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of SS Yarmouth, the first ship to be owned by a black-owned shipping line. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.